So our speaker for today will be Dr. Eric Levine. Eric is a senior epidemiologist with the Air Health Science Division of Health Canada and an adjunct professor with the School of Epidemiology, Public Health and Preventive Medicine at the University of Ottawa. His research focuses on the health effects of exposure to ambient air pollution, in particular for exposures occurring during the prenatal and early life periods. The title of Eric's presentation is Effect Modification of Prenatal Exposure to Ambient Air Pollution and Childhood Asthma Incidents. So now I'm going to pass it over to Eric and Erica will take it from here. Excellent. Thank you. So thanks for the introduction and thanks for um, um, providing the opportunity to uh, do this presentation today. Um, BC Long Association uh, and uh, Megan, thanks for uh, connecting me uh, with BC Long for uh, doing this presentation. So the um, presentation for today is based on uh, some research that I'm doing at uh, Health Canada under the Clean Air uh, Regulatory Agenda uh, research uh, program. And um, the, uh, the idea behind this research is really about uh, looking into um, susceptible populations uh, that are exposed to outdoor air pollution. And one uh, population that has been studied quite a lot are uh, children and pregnant women. We know that air pollution will affect population subgroups differently. Um, there are, has been many studies done um, on issues related with children or pregnant mothers, um, uh, elderly persons that uh, represent susceptible groups. Uh, many research has focused on air pollution in pregnancy. And we know that during pregnancy there are changes, physiological changes that will occur um, that uh, will, will sort of increase the oxygen demand uh, in, uh, in the, the, uh, the mother's uh, physiology. But when we had in the exposure to air pollution, um, the issue is about our uh, exposures uh, related with um, the uh, poor fetal outcomes. Uh, and there has been various studies that have uh, looked into associations between gestational exposure to air pollution and, uh, for example, preterm birth and low birth weight. Um, and a lot of these studies uh, have sort of um, established associations. Some uh, showed that there were negative effects or no effects. And some of the biological mechanisms that have been implicated into the relationship between uh, outdoor air pollution exposure um, during pregnancy on um, the fetal outcomes that could be uh, intrauterine growth uh, retardation or uh, preterm uh, labor um, are sort of highlighted here on this slide. And there are many different mechanisms, uh, although the mechanisms are not quite well understood even uh, today. Uh, uh, we know that there may be some uh, level of inflammation that may be involved in the, uh, the, uh, the pathway leading to perhaps um, some uh, impact on the placenta, which could then specifically uh, affect uh, low birth weight. But then there may be also some pathways that are uh, involving inflammatory markers like increasing level of cytokines that can then uh, lead to uh, prematurity. Um, so the, the associations between prenatal exposure to air pollution um, has focused a lot on adverse birth outcomes. And the uh, latest r reviews that have been done on the topic have shown that uh, associations with low birth weight uh, is pretty consistent but when we look at premature birth, it's a bit more mixed in terms of there may be uh, other confounding factors that are not well uh, adjusted for, like for example, noise exposure uh, that may also be implicated in the, um, uh, the association. Uh, so there's still some research that needs to be done on, on uh, this end. Now, in the recent, uh, in, in the past decade or so, there's been quite a lot of research that has been done on the relationship between uh, the exposure to air pollution and childhood respiratory morbidity. Um, 
understanding that air pollution uh, will affect um, lung function measures during childhood. So uh, the uh, studies that have been conducted so far have looked at maternal exposure and then uh, looking at, for example, lung function measures that are being done during childhood. And uh, these studies have shown that um, some of the lung function measures, for example, uh, FEV1 and force vital capacity peak expiratory flow um, are all being affected um, when uh, uh, these children have been exposed to higher levels of air pollution uh, during the gestational period. And this um, sort of focus on the issue of lung functions being affected has uh, gained a lot of interest in the literature on looking at the prenatal exposure to air pollution and childhood respiratory morbidity. And uh, there's been uh, a lot of research that has been done on this topic uh, as well. Uh, there is sort of suggestive evidence regarding the development of asthma uh, during childhood. Um, and the, uh, there's been research done uh, in Canada, there's been research done in BC and the uh, province of Quebec. Uh, very good studies conducted showing that early life exposure as well as prenatal exposure to air pollution could uh, lead to uh, the development of asthma during childhood. Now, one issue, and that's uh, sort of why this study has been done, is uh, the investigation of effect modifiers in this association. Uh, are they any susceptible groups um, that are mostly affected by the exposure to air pollution on the uh, childhood asthma development? And um, this uh, has been sort of one of the motivation of doing this study. And uh, one issue is about maternal asthma, uh, because some previous studies have shown that perhaps um, maternal allergy or atopic status could be an effect modifier in this relationship. Um, and the other thing is the lack of information on concentration response curve, because as a, a regulatory program here at the Health Canada, we're also interested in uh, understanding better if the uh, uh, risk associated with different uh, pollutants are being seen uh, on a uh, linear uh, uh, concentration response uh, curve. And uh, the concentrations that we're exposed to in Canada, which are lower than other countries, are we still seeing these effects at lower uh, concentrations? So one motivation of this study is also to have a better information on uh, concentration response curve. And uh, this is just showing a um, uh, systematic review uh, that was recently published on the issue of uh, exposure to air pollution and risk of development of childhood asthma that summarizes very well the, uh, the literature um, on the fact that many uh, pollutants have been identified uh, as um, pollutants that are likely um, associated with the risk of asthma development. Um, and most of the study, uh, studies that have been done so far have focused on um, childhood exposures. A lot has been done on early life uh, or childhood exposures. So the um, prenatal exposure hasn't been studied that much. There are studies, but not at the same level as uh, those that are looking at um, early life exposures. So one other motivation of this study was really to look at uh, the exposure uh, during pregnancy to uh, specific criteria pollutants. In this case, we looked at NO2 and PM2.5. And uh, these uh, pollutants have been uh, the, the most studied ones in uh, the scientific literature and for uh, regulatory purposes um, for us at Health, Canada, it's, uh, at Health Canada, it's important to have uh, some uh, evidence-based information for risk assessments and uh, setting standards. And so we looked at the relationship between those pollutants, the exposure during pregnancy on 
the incidence of childhood asthma. And then we also look at uh, the uh, uh, capacity for maternal asthma to be an effect modifier in this relationship. So in other words, are perhaps women with asthma uh, have uh, a, a more of an impact or enhanced effect on the uh, uh, the relationship between uh, air pollution exposure and childhood asthma than those that don't have uh, maternal uh, asthma. So these are the main two objectives that I'll be presenting today. Um, and this study is based on a uh, retrospective cohort that has been conducted in uh, Ontario um, using uh, a database of pregnant women who gave birth to singleton infants uh, between the years of 2006 to 2012. Uh, the uh, record linkage has been done at the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences, uh, ISIS. And um, so we, we used a database called the BORN Registry, which stands for Better Outcomes Registry Network. Uh, this registry contains a lot of information on uh, maternal uh, risk factors and um, uh, childhood uh, um, uh, risk factors as well. So uh, we used the uh, database that was available from 2006 onward at um, ISIS. And then it was linked to a uh, database of um, incident childhood uh, asthma cases that were diagnosed before six years of age. And this database is housed at ISIS. It's called the Ontario uh, Asthma Surveillance Information System. It's, uh, it's been a validated uh, case definition that's been used. And uh, we limited the... Um, uh, the time frame of identifying uh, childhood asthma uh, for uh, under six years of age because a lot of the studies um, have shown that uh, the exposure in early life uh, or prenatal exposure might be more related to preschool year uh, children uh, so under six years of age that's approximately um, uh, the case and then in terms of the exposures, we uh, got information on exposures to PM2.5 and NO2. PM2.5 was gathered from satellite uh, estimates that are available at a one by one kilometer resolution. Um, and they are uh, available on uh, a three month basis for each year between 2006 and uh, 2012. And then we used a uh, uh, national land use regression model that we uh, temporarily scaled so that we can capture uh, trimester specific exposures. So both these uh, um, exposure assessment uh, methods were used so that we could uh, go beyond just looking at urban areas uh, so that we could also look at rural areas um, where we can um, have also exposures to uh, some of these pollutants. And so this is a summary of the administrative data linkage that uh, was done. So we have the, the BORN database, which is our baseline um, registry uh, or birth uh, cohort. And then it was linked with the uh, asthma cohort or the asthma database. And we also linked with some uh, population and demographics data so that we can capture uh, census data, for example, socioeconomic status at the neighborhood level. And this is basically our uh, study population. And so this um, cohort has been used before, just as an FYI. Um, this study was published a few months ago. Uh, we used the same cohort, but looking at uh, risk of early childhood cancers um, and so uh, if you want more information on uh, the cohort itself, uh, you can uh, retrieve this uh, paper online. And uh, this paper has also been published on uh, using the same cohort uh, as what I'm presenting today. Um, so the covariates that were used in this analysis, many covariates were retrieved. We got birth date, birth weight, infant sex, gestational age, uh, maternal age. Uh, some important uh, 
covariates that we had access to were uh, maternal cigarette smoking, uh, maternal intention to breastfeed. So these were um, uh, retrieved from the born cohort. Um, and that's sort of one of the main reasons why we, we use that, uh, uh, that cohort from uh, 2006. Uh, we got information from maternal history of asthma um, because uh, we wanted to look at, at it as an effect modifier. Uh, we got also information on green space exposure as it could be a confounder in the relationship. And we also had information on SES variables at the neighborhood level. So we used a uh, standard uh, statistical approach, the random effects uh, Cox proportional hazard. Um, I'm not, not going to provide more details re really about this. Um, and the effect modification was investigated by maternal asthma. So I'm presenting to you sort of uh, some of the findings that we got from this study. And um, this is just um, showing you some selected descriptive statistics. Uh, we have a population of 700, 760,000 which is probably one of the largest sample size um, in terms of looking at associations between um, exposure to air pollution during pregnancy and childhood asthma development. We had uh, about 110,000 or 111,000 asthmatic children, 45,000 mothers with asthma, and the average time from birth until asthma diagnosis was about two years of age. And in terms of our main exposures, uh, the NO2 and PM2.5 variables, um, we looked at the effects per interquartile range increase, which is pretty standard in uh, the air pollution uh, literature. And so um, here I've just uh, written down the IQRs for uh, each trimester of exposure and the overall pregnancy exposure uh, IQR, so 9.6 per uh, uh, PPB means it's 9.6 for the first trimester and then the second, third, and uh, the overall is 8.6. And same thing for PM2.5, uh, the IQRs are written down here. And so the first thing that we did is really we wanted to look at uh, whether the um, uh, pollutants were associated with the outcome in terms of uh, is there a linear relationship? And this here is uh, presenting a concentration response curve between NO2 exposure uh, during the whole pregnancy period on the incidence of childhood asthma development. And we are seeing this as a sort of a linear increase uh, even at low levels uh, of exposure we are seeing uh, an increased risk, which is sort of increasing monotonically. And uh, we're seeing this shape for PM2.5 uh, as a concentration response curve. So these are uh, the first steps really that we wanted to look at. And these are important because uh, they can tell a lot uh, about the relationship uh, that we're investigating. And obviously they can be very important for uh, regulatory purposes. And um, this here is presenting uh, the uh, relationship between uh, NO2 and uh, PM2.5, the exposure during each trimester and uh, the impact on uh, childhood asthma development. And so what we're seeing is that uh, for NO2, uh, that's again per interquartile range, we're seeing these increases in the three trimesters and uh, also the overall pregnancy exposure. And as well as for uh, PM2.5, uh, the uh, uh, exposures during all trimesters and the pregnancy uh, overall exposure were all statistically significant and showing an increased risk. Now, one thing here that needs to be uh, mentioned is really about the correlation between the uh, exposure uh, to NO2, the correlation coefficients between each periods of exposure. For NO2, it was moderately correlated, the exposures. So we did use a temporal adjustment using the land use uh, regression model, but still we were um, uh, 
uh, having some moderate level correlations between each trimester exposure. And for PM 2.5, uh, the correlations were moderate to uh, high. So that's why we're seeing these effects that are very close to each other. Perhaps here we cannot really well sort of disentangle the, uh, the effect from one trimester to another and, um, and from the overall pregnancy uh, exposure. And uh, one other issue was really about, uh, well, are we seeing these effects bef because we, uh, it's, the, the exposure is related to the first year of, of life? Uh, so maybe the risk is mostly being seen after birth. And so we adjusted, we additionally adjusted for first year of life exposure, uh, which is an important consideration uh, in terms of sort of identifying the critical windows of exposure. And then here what we're seeing is that after adjusting, uh, we're still seeing some effect in the first trimester and for NO2, but uh, the second and third trimester were not significant. And, and then the overall pregnancy exposure here was probably driven by the first trimester uh, exposure. And um, so uh, this is for uh, after adjusting um, for the first year of life uh, exposure. And then when we looked at PM 2.5, um, the, uh, the effects uh, dropped a little bit, but we don't see sort of a, a big difference between each trimesters uh, of exposure, even after adjusting for the first year of life. And so one uh, important aspect that we looked at is the effect modification by maternal asthma. And when we look at effect modification in an epidemiological point of view, what's important is that um, uh, effect modification can be investigated on a multiplicative and an additive scale. So we looked at both. And this is um, the uh, results showing you uh, the effect of NO2 overall, uh, over the whole pregnancy period on uh, the incidence of childhood asthma, but stratified by maternal asthma status. And so what we're seeing here is that the effects are really uh, similar, whether we uh, look at uh, mothers who have asthma or those that don't, although the, the effect is a little bit higher among uh, children who are born uh, from mothers who have uh, asthma. Uh, but the p-value for effect modification, so uh, this is sort of an indication whether uh, there's uh, statistically significant effect modification. It's at 0.40, so it's not showing any statistically significant effect. And then when we look at PM 2.5, it's about the same thing here. The effects are pretty similar although um, the hazard ratio is a little bit higher in the strata of those that don't have asthma. And again, the uh, p-value here is not significant. And so one other way of looking at effect modification uh, is through the additive scale. Uh, and uh, some have suggested that additive scale may be perhaps more important uh, on a public health point of view. And so here, this table is showing you the, uh, the different hazard ratios, the risks associated with um, the childhood asthma development in each combination of our two main variables. So PM 2.5 in this case was stratified in four quartiles and maternal asthma was a binary variable, so whether uh, yes, asthma was present or not. And so each combination here is uh, a combination of um, those that are in the category of uh, mothers that didn't have asthma and that are in the second quartile of exposure to PM 2.5. And these are compared to the baseline reference category, which is no maternal asthma and low levels of exposure to PM 2.5, which is Q1, first quartile. And so what we are seeing is that as we increase uh, in categories, the hazard ratio increases. And when we look at the combined effect of maternal asthma 
with the highest level of exposure to PM2.5, we are seeing this hazard ratio of 1.58. And this is when they are compared to those that are in the lowest category of exposure and uh, those that don't have asthma. But then when we uh, look at the relative excess risk due to interaction, which is a measure looking at uh, the uh, additive scale interaction, whether it's significant or not, the uh, results are showing that there are no interaction on the additive scale here for PM2.5 and maternal asthma. So this here is showing that it's not significant since it's overlapping the zero, the null value. Uh, and in this case, when we looked at NO2 in combination with maternal asthma, um, we uh, did the same, but when we uh, sort of combine the categories of maternal asthma with Q4, the highest level of exposure, we have an hazard ratio of 1.77, and the relative excess risk due to interaction is statistically significant. So this is sort of indicating that the combined effect of uh, being high, highly exposed to NO2 with uh, mat maternal asthma being present is higher than the sum of the independent effect of each factor. So this is an indication that there is something going on on the additive scale interaction and perhaps there is effect modification by uh, maternal asthma in uh, this study. So just going to go over some uh, of the discussion points and I'm going to open it up for, uh, for questions and comments. Um, in this study, we have seen uh, an association between exposure to NO2 and PM2.5 with increased risk of developing asthma. And there is suggestive evidence that children of mothers who have a history of asthma and who were in the upper quartile of exposure to NO2 during the prenatal period were 1.7 times more at risk of developing uh, asthma compared to children of mothers without asthma and with NO2 exposure below the, 25, the 25th percentile. And so the, the biological mechanism that I've shown earlier, they're sort of similar in terms of how pollutants can affect uh, the um, lung function and perhaps respiratory morbidity and uh, asthma development. Pollutants can be associated with systemic inflammation. Uh, they can be associated with endothelial changes. We know that uh, pollutants can cause oxidative stress. So all of these issues here can perhaps be related with uh, affecting the immune system of uh, the fetus. Uh, there are also uh, issues that it could affect directly the lung function uh, or the lung development of uh, the fetus. And, and so these different pathways are sort of the uh, hypothesized pathways through which uh, pollutants could be linked to uh, respiratory morbidity. Uh, and uh, childhood asthma. And in this study, we, uh, we sort of have suggested evidence that there is an effect modification by maternal asthma. The mechanism is not well understood, but the exposure to air pollution during pregnancy might lead to some level of exacerbations of maternal asthma uh, for those that are diagnosed with, uh, with asthma prior to their pregnancy. And this could translate into a higher susceptibility for the infant to develop asthma during childhood, perhaps through an inflammation pathway. Uh, there could also be indication of genetic susceptibility among those that are already sensitized. So the exact mechanism of action is uh, not clearly understood, but certainly it, opened it, it opens it up for, for future research in this area. So in terms of the implications of our findings, uh, definitely on a regulatory point of view, these findings suggest that the reductions in NO2 and PM2.5 may reduce risk of childhood asthma uh, in children of mothers with and without asthma. So 
keeping on working on these regulatory standards, these risk assessments, making sure that uh, we in Canada uh, have uh, these standards for outdoor air pollution so that we uh, have reduced uh, exposures to outdoor air pollution issues. And even at low concentrations, we are seeing these effects. Uh, so it's important that these studies are being done in Canada as well. And on a clinical point of view, the findings suggest that maternal asthma modifies the relationship uh, between NO2 and childhood asthma development. So in terms of the, the clinical aspect of the, the finding, it's really about giving clear advice uh, to uh, patients that are pregnant, and not only those that have asthma, uh, but in general to patients, uh, to, to expecting mothers, uh, so that they can reduce their exposures to uh, outdoor air pollution. The AQHI is a good uh, um, way of um, keeping track of the outdoor air pollution issues. Patients who are pregnant are in this vulnerable uh, group uh, in the AQHI. So for, for clinicians to be able to um, to give advice and clear instructions to their patients about uh, the use of uh, uh, AQHI or uh, making sure that they look out for uh, what's the uh, what's the uh, the, uh, um, the forecast for the outdoor air issues on a specific day. This may, in some way, reduce uh, exposures uh, to uh, outdoor air pollution. And so this study has uh, some limitations, the lack of information on some confounders. We didn't have information on maternal obesity or maternal gestational weight gain. Uh, we also did not have information on asthma phenotypes or asthma severity. Or for example, we didn't have information on whether uh, maternal asthma cases uh, were taking medications, uh, corticosteroids or uh, bronchodilators during pregnancy. So uh, we don't know if they did have uh, an exacerbation or not um, uh, after being exposed to air pollution. Uh, there's a high level of correlations between time windows and that's uh, also a limitation in our study. Um, the large sample size, the availability of air pollution uh, exposure across the large geographical area of Ontario is definitely a uh, strength of our study and we also captured residential mobility uh, during uh, during the pregnancy period so that we can uh, account for the fact that some of them moved during pregnancy. And so what are the next steps? And uh, in terms of this specific study, we are interested in looking at oxidative potential. So the capacity for example PM 2.5 to deplete um, antioxidants that are uh, um, available in, in the human lungs. Um, and this could be sort of a, an analysis that will uh, provide more insights on the biological mechanism uh, into the association we're looking at. We're also looking into uh, uh, an analysis looking at ultrafine particles exposure and uh, the childhood asthma uh, development. And some uh, of the recommendation of future studies is really about refining the exposure assessment for identifying critical windows of, uh, of exposure. Um, just uh, I want to acknowledge the contribution of many uh, people I've been working with, fantastic group uh, of people who have provided uh, study design methods, uh, advice, as well as uh, exposure data that were used for uh, this study. And uh, I will open it up for questions if um, anyone has questions. So thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. That was a really interesting presentation. Um, if you have any questions and you haven't already entered them into the chat yeah. function or the question box, um, please do enter them in. Um, Eric, are you able to see the questions? At the moment, no, I cannot. Okay, uh, I've got a couple that I've pulled up here. Um, sure. So the first one, let's see. Oh, I think she might be. Uh, 
starting from here. Okay, so it says, I would like to know how the relative mm -hmm. excess risk... Oh, at the top. Okay, it says, case definition based on doctor's visits and hospital discharges. How was the temporal scale based on for the national LUR model? Is this model developed by Perry Heistad? If I'm interested in the statistical modeling, where can I have more information? And well, maybe I'll stop there and let you um, sure. take let you take those ones, and then we can move on to the last bit. Yeah. So the yeah the LUR model is the one developed by Perry Eisted, and uh, we worked uh, together so that we can have an approach to do the temporal scaling. So um, Perry uh, Eisted has been helpful and in providing um, advice on doing this temporal adjustment. And where can the person have more information on the statistical approach? Well, uh, there's a paper on the way, and uh, perhaps in a few months uh, this, this paper will be published. But definitely, if the person really wants to get more information on the statistical approach, we can exchange by emails, and I can, I can provide more details on this end. Okay, thanks Eric. And then um, to continue on, it says, I would like to know how the relative excess risk due to interaction is obtained. Um, was there any effect modification by rurality, urbanicity? I would expect that there would be a protective effect perhaps on an ad additive scale based on what we know, re-hygiene hypothesis. And thank That's you. That's a very, very good suggestion uh, slash question. Uh, we did look at urbanicity um, and uh, we looked at it on a multiplicative scale only. We saw that the effects were higher in urban areas compared to uh, rural areas. So the effects of uh, NO2 and PM2.5 were higher in urban areas. So um, yeah, that's uh, definitely a, a good suggestion. Okay, and then we have one more here that says, what is the role for maternal HLP in AP exposure? So what's the role of uh, maternal HLP? Uh, well, it's, uh, it may have different uh, roles here. Um, one could be that, um, the, um, for example, air pollution exposure could exacerbate the condition of um, of a pregnant woman who has uh, an atopic disease, so meaning that it could exacerbate asthma. Uh, by exacerbating asthma, it means that it could um, influence the level of inflammation, uh, perhaps in the lungs and systemic uh, circulation, which could also translate into more inflammation to the placenta. Um, and so, that's sort of the role that could be implicated here, uh, why maternal atopy could be important in this relationship. Uh, those that don't have an atopic disease may not have these exacerbations due to air pollution at the same level as those that are uh, atopic. Okay, and then the next question is, other than the AQHI, are there any other tools that pregnant mothers can use to adjust their exposure to air pollution? Well, currently, uh, the AQHI is probably the best tool that can be used. Um, and the, the other probably uh, advice that can be given is the discussions that the, the, the mother can have, the, the pregnant uh, women can have with uh, the physicians regarding uh, perhaps changing their um, their exposures are there any ways that uh, on an individual point of view this can be changed there's a, also some recommendations that is, are being given uh, by Health Canada on uh, the website uh, that can be found online but AQHI right now is a really uh, good tool in terms of uh, advising um, uh, vulnerable groups and the general population. All right, and then um, this one is going back to one of the first questions, and it says, my first question on case definition is, how was asthma case defined? Okay, so the asthma case was defined as uh, 
it, it's it's a pretty standard approach. It's been used in BC uh, by uh, uh, researchers who uh, have uh, looked at association between air pollution and asthma. And in Ontario, this case definition was that in um, in a um, one year uh, period, uh, it is um, two diagnosis of physician billing. So if the uh, child went to their doctor uh, at least twice um, or if there was an hospitalization uh, for asthma. So if, for example, the child was not uh, hospitalized but the child had to go to um, an external clinic uh, and visit the doctor and then there was a diagnosis of asthma that was billed to uh, the Ontario Health Insurance uh, Program, OHIP, uh, then this was captured in a database that are housed at the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences. And then we are able to know those that uh, have been uh, identified uh, uh, in these database. So the OASIS database, Ontario Asthma Surveillance Information System, already captures these cases of asthma based on this case definition. In this case definition, if the person who has the question would like to have really more information about it, there's been studies done by, uh, for example, Teresa Toe, who's on uh, this uh, research team, um, who have validated the case definition of childhood asthma. So uh, I could probably provide a paper uh, and this paper shows exactly the sensitivity and specificity uh, of this case definition that was used in this study. All right, and we have another question that is, uh, what about antibodies crossing the placenta? Well, that's a very good suggestion slash question. I think that uh, we don't really have, we don't have the information since we're using population uh, health administrative data. Uh, so we don't know the level of antibodies uh, crossing the placenta and whether they uh, are implicated in the mechanism of action. We, we have no idea uh, in the data that we are using. All right, and we have a comment going back to the maternal atopic status um, and it says maternal atopic status can have an effect through epigenetic mechanisms. Yeah, that's um, definitely uh, another mechanism of uh, action that can be implicated and that means that, for example, a child that is born from uh, a woman that has uh, asthma uh, could have a genetic susceptibility uh, to atopic status, to atopic diseases. So um, that could be another pathway um, being that if this child is already sensitized to um, uh, a sort of an allergic reaction, then uh, the exposure to air pollution could sort of be a, a trigger in the equation. And it may not necessarily just be the exposure during pregnancy, but it could also be the exposure during the early, uh, the early period. So the epigenetic uh, mechanism that was raised by uh, the person who, who suggested that is, is actually a very important consideration. Okay, and uh, one more question. Was there any data available on father's asthma status? Um, we uh, did not capture the uh, father's asthma status. Um, we had uh, difficulty in linking the information uh, in the health administrative database to father's asthma. Uh, status and so there we, we did not have the information the, the short answer would be this um, this could perhaps be uh, a sensitivity analysis we could do but we wouldn't be able to capture the information on father's asthma status for the whole um, for their whole cohort so and and the father's asthma status could actually be an interesting analysis to do because it could go in line with the previous comment about the sort of uh, epigenetic susceptibility. 
All right. I think that has answered all of the questions that have come in. We'll give it one more minute in case anyone else has any questions. Just a reminder that um, there's a, a little questions box off to the side of your screen, and if you do have anything else you'd like to ask Eric, you can type something in there. Um, if you if something comes to mind after the webinar is over, Eric has said he'd be willing to answer any questions um, after the fact, and I believe on his last slide uh, his contact information is listed there. Um, and, and I guess while we're just waiting here to see if any final co questions or comments come in, I want to thank Eric for taking the time to give us a presentation today on his work. It was really interesting. Um, and thank everyone who participated uh, and also to remind you that we will be sending out an evaluation and if you could please take the time to fill that out for us it would be really helpful for us. And one final reminder uh, to let everyone know that the slides and uh, the webinar will be posted to the BC Lund website. Oh, I do see one more question has come in. Eric, uh, what might be other important air pollutants factors that could impact this risk? Other air pollutant factors, other air, air pollutants, basically? It says, the question says, what uh, might be other air pollutants slash factors that could impact the risk? Well, we know that um, perhaps uh, oxidative potential might be uh, an important aspect. Um, so the, uh, as I mentioned in one of the last few slides, the um, uh, capacity for, for pollutants to, to induce oxidative stress. This might be an important measure slash metric uh, to look out for. Um, we could also um, look into uh, the ozone um, uh, as a pollutant uh, that might be also important because we know that ozone is a respiratory irritant. In terms of other factors, well, there are other factors. I mentioned that maternal obesity is uh, a risk factor. Uh, that we did not uh, consider in our study, uh, but there is more and more studies uh, coming in on uh, maternal stress levels um, and perhaps early life stress as being a, a sort of a um, social uh, indicator of uh, the risk. So we did not have that information as well. We did um, we did capture the neighborhood uh, adjustment uh, using socioeconomic status, so it may capture in some way uh, some of these variables, but we did not have the individual level information on maternal stress, so it, that's a, a, probably another important risk factor to consider for future studies. Okay, um, we have a comment. It says, a remark for Dr. Levine, the UFP estimates have a lot of variability. The LUR we have developed in BC shows a low R squared. So UFP may be a tricky measure to look into. That's a good comment. Definitely a good comment. I appreciate this, uh, this information. <laughs> 